Mark Futado's examination of Psalm 18 delves into the interpretive complexities that biblical scholars and readers face when approaching this ancient text. The title of Psalm 18 alone is a source of multiple questions for the interpreter, ranging from the meaning of terms that refer to persons such as the director of music or leader, to uncertainties concerning the connection between the end of Psalm 17 and the beginning of Psalm 18. Distinctions about whether David was the author, inspiration, subject, or collator of these sacred songs further obscure our understanding of origins and intention. Beyond the debate over authorship, Futado questions the historical note that comes with Psalm 18. This note claims that David sang these words after being delivered from his enemies, including Saul. Critics debate the authenticity and importance of this note, pondering whether it is an indispensable interpretive key or whether it merely suggests one context among many. Further, the identities of the enemies and the precise translation related to Saul offer additional text-critical challenges. In addressing these issues, Futado's objective isn't to simply resolve each question, but to provide readers with interpretive tools to independently tackle such questions within the Psalms. He organizes the queries into three focal points, the historical context of Psalms and their interpretation, the textual preservation and criticism needed for understanding the Psalms, and a survey of resources contributing to proper interpretation. Regarding historical context, Futado explores the role of historical settings in interpretation, the enduring and universal applicability of the Psalms, and the dilemma of pinpointing a specific historical context for their reading. He emphasizes the Psalms' temporal adaptability as a means through which they resonate with generations of readers across varying situations. The text of the Psalms, too, presents a myriad of issues. Futato discusses the quality of the text's preservation over millennia and introduces the concept and necessity of text criticism, a scientific method employed to reconstruct the original wording of the biblical text, as an important aspect of psalmody scholarship. Also, Futato speaks to the wealth of resources available to those interpreting the Psalms. He accentuates that a well-equipped reader will consider a variety of scholarly works and methodologies to deepen their understanding of these poetic expressions of piety, lament, and praise. Overall, Futato's approach encourages an engagement with the Psalms that is both informed and appreciative of the depth and historical layers intrinsic to these timeless biblical hymns. Moreover, Futado's exploration of the Psalms addresses the challenge of identifying the historical context for interpreting these biblical songs. Traditional biblical hermeneutics suggest understanding a text within its original historical setting. Several Psalms do include such historical information, pointing to this as a relevant approach. However, most Psalms do not lend themselves easily to historical categorization. The complication arises when a Psalm like Psalm 90 ostensibly connected to Moses around 1400 BC, is then found in the Psalter's final form, a collection likely compiled centuries later, which shifts the contextual considerations for interpretation. Futado draws attention to the titles of individual psalms, noting that while they are recognized as part of the canonical scripture, they might not have been part of the original compositions. Differences in titles across manuscripts, such as between the Masoretic text, MT, and the Septuagint, LXX, support this view. Furthermore, he observes that the language used in the Psalms' titles suggests they were ancient but added through editorial processes over time. Some linguistic elements in the titles were already lost or misunderstood by the translators of the LXX. Regarding canonical acceptance, New Testament references to the titles as Scripture, along with their integration into other canonical books like 2 Samuel and Habakkuk, validate their scriptural status. Nevertheless, Futado finds that the historical context provided by the titles has a minimal impact on his interpretive approach. This is due to the absence of detailed correlation between the historical events in 1 and 2 Samuel and the text of the Psalms, unknown historical figures like Cush in Psalm 7, and occasionally a disparity between the Psalms' emotions and the historical situation indicated by the title. In summary, while the historical information embedded in the psalm titles is canonical and sheds light on potential backstories of the compositions, 
Their lack of specificity and the generalized universal language of the Psalms themselves render them of limited use in exegesis. Futado ultimately perceives the Psalms as possessing an enduring, timeless quality that transcends the precise historical moments of their conception. Furthermore, Futado's analysis of the Psalms affirms their enduring relevance due to their broad and nonspecific language. This characteristic makes them accessible and applicable across generations and individual circumstances. Futado asserts that many Psalms, such as Psalms 3 to 7, mention adversaries and challenges without detailing their identities or the nature of the conflicts. For example, the foes, arrogant individuals, and enemies that David speaks of remain unnamed, and his distresses' causes are not elaborated upon. This generality extends even to descriptions of illness, where physical symptoms could metaphorically represent other adversities. Futado argues that this intentional lack of historical detail is not a deficit, but a virtue. The universality of the psalm's language enables readers from any era to find parallels in their own lives, making these ancient songs a living resource for spiritual reflection and solace. Without concrete references to the specific circumstances of the past, the psalms do not alienate contemporary readers who might not share the same context. Instead, they invite personal application. To illustrate this point further, Futato draws a parallel with the New Testament, where Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. This issue's ambiguity has prompted commentary and speculation, as its nature is never clarified within the Scripture. Theologian Philip Hughes contends that this lack of specificity means that Paul's thorn can act as a metaphor for a wide range of afflictions that teach humility and dependence on God. In embracing this understanding of the Psalms, Futato highlights their ability to bridge the gap between ancient text and modern experience. The timeless nature of these biblical songs lies in their capacity to convey emotional sincerity and spiritual truth without being bound by their original context. Readers can thus interpret and internalize the Psalms in ways that resonate with their current challenges and spiritual journeys, making these writings an impactful and enduring component of religious literature. In addition, Futato examines the Psalms through the lens of their historical context, drawing from Bruce Waltke's concept that a single psalm can take on different meanings as the biblical canon evolves and expands. To understand the layered historical contexts of the Psalms, particularly Psalm 89, Futado proposes a series of interpretive questions. What did the psalm mean to the original author? How was it understood by the post-exilic community that finalized the Hebrew Bible? And what significance does it hold for New Testament authors? Focusing on Psalm 89 with special attention to verses 39, 45, he discusses the possible original context during the reign of King Solomon and the subsequent reign of his son, Rehoboam. During Rehoboam's rule, the assault on Jerusalem by the Egyptian pharaoh Shishak resonates with the language of devastation in the psalm. Thus, in its earliest setting, the psalm might have been a prayer for the restoration of Rehoboam's kingship after the temple and the palace were looted. For the post-exilic community, these verses likely echoed the deeper tragedy of the Babylonian conquest and the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, intensifying the psalm's plea as it transformed into a hope for the restoration of the Davidic monarchy, which had become a distant memory. In New Testament times, Futado debates that Psalm 89 finds its resolution in Jesus Christ, who embodies the manifestation of God's steadfast love and loyalty to the covenant with David. The psalm reassures Christians of God's enduring promises, symbolized in the life and ministry of Jesus. Despite this fulfillment, Christians still confront a world that falls short of the glorified kingdom depicted in the biblical narratives. This discrepancy instigates a continuing cry for divine intervention and a yearning for the full realization of Jesus' kingdom on earth. Futado concludes that Psalm 89, therefore, not only testifies to God's unbroken promises, as affirmed by Christ's coming, but also serves as a voice for believers who grapple with the present imperfections of the world, encouraging them to persist in prayer and actions toward realizing God's will on earth, echoing the sentiment that all of God's promises are a yes in Christ. Further, Futado raises critical questions regarding its canonical content and original phrasing. 
He brings to light that different communities have used varying versions of the Psalms, as seen in Greek and Syriac editions, which include a 151st Psalm, and in the case of the Syriac, even additional Psalms beyond this. As if this weren't complex enough, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically a Psalm scroll from Qumran, 11 QPSA, challenges traditional conceptions as it features a unique selection and arrangement of Psalms, some of which do not align with the canonical Psalter, known from the Masoretic text. A historical perspective is provided through Bruce Waltke's research, which traces the text's evolution from its formative stages, circa 1400, 400 BC, to the establishment of the Proto-Masoretic text around 100 AD, subsequently leading to the canonical Masoretic text around 1000 AD. Throughout this period, the conflicting tendencies of preserving or revising the text were observed. However, the inclination towards preservation became more pronounced over time, signaling a waning of textual alterations, even within linguistic practices like the use of vowel letters in Hebrew, a deduction that holds true despite evidence of linguistic evolution at Qumran. Immanuel Tov distinguishes between the compositional phase of a biblical book and the transmission stage of the text, treated as finished and authoritative. Tov posits that the various text types present before the authoritative text were also seen authoritatively by their respective communities at the time. In sum, Waltke and Futato echo the stance that, despite the existence of multiple text types, the MT is to be considered the authoritative text. As corroborated by the early church and synagogue, the MT became the standard, as suggested by the works of ancient scholars such as Origen and Jerome. Brevard Childs concurs, reasoning that the MT inherently proved itself superior, thus becoming an integral part of the canon. Despite divergent texts like 11 QPSAA, which some scholars view as either alternative canonical traditions or distinct liturgical compositions, Futado disputes that they do not undermine the MT's canonical status. In essence, the MT, with its 150 psalms, reigns as the established text for the Book of Psalms. Besides, in his analysis of text criticism, Futato focuses on Psalm 104, 6a, to show the necessity of this scholarly pursuit in biblical interpretation. The verse in Hebrew presents challenges both grammatically and theologically, which have led scholars to scrutinize the original text for better clarity and understanding. The grammatical problem arises from the Hebrew phrase translated as you covered it, where the pronoun it is masculine singular, with no clear masculine antecedent in the context. Futato indicates that the nearby word for earth is feminine, which should logically be the antecedent. This incongruence is further maintained by the Septuagint and Vulgate translations, which render the phrase in a way that suggests a reading of his garment, reflecting a masculine possessive form that aligns with the pronoun it. The theological dilemma is found in the context of the creation narrative within the psalm, where God is said to cover the land with waters referred to as the deep. The psalm goes on to depict God rebuking the waters and setting their boundaries, which seemingly contradicts the initial act of covering the land with water. This apparent contradiction is particularly pronounced when juxtaposed with the creation story in Genesis 1, where water is separated from the land prior to the emergence of dry ground. Proposing a minor but critical emendation, Futato suggests reading it covered it, thus resolving the issues. The deep waters, then, are the subject that covered the earth, a perspective that aligns with Genesis 1. Consequently, the picture that emerges is one of coherence between the narratives of Genesis and Psalm 104, with God initially allowing the deep to cover the earth and subsequently setting the waters into their designated place. Futado reassures readers that such textual emendations do not impact any fundamental Christian doctrines. Instead, he argues that text criticism enhances our understanding and interpretation of Scripture, ultimately aiding in more accurate teaching and preaching. By engaging in such scholarly efforts, one can appreciate the depth of the biblical text and its intended message. Last but not least, Futato's discussion on the Psalms points out the essential role of text criticism in biblical scholarship, particularly in discerning the most faithful rendering of the Hebrew Bible.
Text criticism involves careful analysis and comparison of various manuscripts to identify and correct errors and omissions that have occurred over millennia of transmission. In his explanation, Futado lays out two guiding principles critical to text critical methodology. Firstly, the need to avoid exclusive dependence on external evidence, such as other Hebrew manuscripts and ancient translations. And secondly, the recommendation to prioritize internal evidence. This internal evidence encompasses a spectrum of considerations within the text itself, including its morphological, syntactical, and literary nuances. By harmonizing internal factors, such as grammatical and theological context, with the ancillary role played by external sources, a more informed, text-critical decision can be reached. To equip interpreters with the necessary skills to engage in text criticism of the Hebrew Bible robustly, Futato advocates for a sequential learning path, starting with foundational introductions that cover basics of the discipline. He cites concise and insightful works from Chisholm and Waltke that touch upon both practical aspects and the theoretical relationship between text criticism, exegesis, and theology. The next step is to dive into intermediate materials, which offer comprehensive overviews of why text criticism is indispensable, how textual errors propagate, and the framework scholars should apply in rendering decisions. P. Kyle McCarter and J. Weingreen provide substantial discussions on the prevalence of textual inaccuracies and the importance of recognizing such errors. For the deepest level of understanding, heavyweight texts by scholars such as Brotsman, Tov, and Worthwein should be consulted. These encompass thorough introductions to the intricacies of text criticism. The Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, BHS, serves as the bedrock of text critical study, although additional resources are required to navigate its complex apparatus, which includes abbreviations and symbols. Futado endorses guides to BHS and a reference list by Vasholtz, easing the task of interpretation. In sum, Futado's outline presents a layered approach to mastering text criticism, reiterating its indispensability for interpreting the Psalms and, by extension, the entire Hebrew canon. With a structured learning trajectory, scholars and students alike can gain a profound understanding of the nuanced task of reconstructing the most accurate biblical text possible. In conclusion, Futado digs into the complexities of interpreting Psalm 18 and the broader Psalter through a scholarly lens that considers authorship, historical context, and textual criticism. He interrogates the significance of the Psalm titles, the purported historical notes that accompany them, and the overall authorial intent. The attribution of certain psalms to David raises questions about the historical accuracy of these claims and the role such historical notes play in interpreting the texts. Additionally, Futato challenges the traditional hermeneutic approach that stresses the importance of understanding a text within its original historical setting. He uses Psalm 18 as a case study to showcase the interpretive challenges posed by references to historical figures or events. He disputes that while psalms like Psalm 90 are tied to individuals such as Moses, the final compilation of these texts occurred centuries later, impacting the way in which interpretations are shaped. Also, he notes that the titles and superscriptions of individual psalms may have been included through editorial processes, albeit recognized as canonical, their historical value for exegesis remains contested. Moreover, Futado emphasizes the universal applicability of the Psalms due to their general language. This quality enables them to provide spiritual support and reflection to individuals across different eras, with readers able to find relatable elements within the verses regardless of their specific historical background. Furthermore, the discussion touches upon the adaptation of the Psalms' meanings across various historical contexts. Futado gives the example of Psalm 89, which could resonate differently with the original author, the post-exilic Jewish community, and Christians in the New Testament era, with each finding relevant connections and fulfillment in the unfolding biblical narrative. In addition, in his examination of text criticism, Futado highlights its significance in resolving textual issues that may arise, using Psalm 104. 6a as an illustration of how emendation can align the psalms with other creation narratives like that in Genesis. Asserting that text criticism does not undermine fundamental Christian doctrines, he insists it enhances the interpretation of Scripture for teaching and preaching. 
Futato concludes by advocating a methodical learning approach to text criticism for scholars and students, recommending various resources that range from introductory to advanced levels, such as the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia and accompanying guides. His methodology underscores the importance of integrating both internal textual analysis and external manuscript evidence for a robust biblical understanding, reaffirming the psalm's capacity to communicate spiritual truths across time and contexts.